Hello, and thank you for joining for the first edition of One Young World Together Apart series. My name is Amal Kalian Busiko, and I'm a proud One Young World Coordinating Ambassador from Haiti. I attended 2015 and 2016 summits in Bangkok and Ottawa. I am the founder of Bunch, the very first Haitian co-working space and community building around entrepreneurship initiative in Haiti. We're trying to bring people together around technology and see how we can recreate the economy and be a model for the world. I am thrilled to be speaking with Elio Leonichetti, CEO of The Craftery, the first investment house for mission-driven challenger brands. He's also a One Young World trustee and a board non-executive director at ANB InBev and Barry Calabot. As we know, COVID-19 pandemic has set in motion a global economic slowdown, and this has put businesses of all sizes in incredibly challenging situations. So Elio, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Before we begin, um, tell us a little bit, we know you are from Italy, how is your family doing? We know Italy was actually very affected by the corona crisis. So yes, well, um, pleasure to meet you and congratulations on your badge um, activities and the other things that you just said. Um, in this moment, you know, keeping a positive outlook and being active at building things rather than just staying on the back foot is, is, is fundamental. So congrats on that. Um, so I'm Italian, but I live in uh, England. I've been in London for 20 years. And Italian, you know, um, family uh, tells me that they are safe and healthy, which is good and our friends um but they you know conditions in italy as as we will know it's very intense uh today i just read that it's um again the highest uh day of death ever recorded so we were hoping that this would come down it didn't lots of questions about the uh you know impact of the uh lockdown and very tight measure uh so we'll see how that goes uh but the country is in a very difficult position and uh Everybody on the good side is kind of, you know, pulling together, um, trying to be as you know, organized and disciplined and as serious as they can in order to stay off the streets and make things uh, for the best. Um, in England, we are on the curve, um, you know, following about two, three weeks, uh, Italy. But, you know, today we learned that the prime minister also um, caught, uh, you know, coronavirus. So there is clearly, you know, an emotional um, additional uh, concern on top of the data-based uh, one that we that we all uh, that we all know. So difficult time for everybody, um, but you know, as for everything, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, well, yes, it is very sad, but we are at least glad that your family is okay. okay. I will I will start with the first question from an ambassador um, in India, Jamal. She would like to know, given the importance of cash flow for startups right and small businesses mm -hmm. how can entrepreneurs increase or maintain investment during this period of uncertainty so the key things in a period of uncertainties and this is clearly you know one is to um, look at what is the profitable core of your activity whatever that is um, in moment of uncertainty you don't know if the cash will be sufficient to take you to the end um, and uh, whenever you start an idea at the beginning, it's a very simple idea. But then with time, this idea tends to become more complex and you add things to it. If you're selling a product, you add in three variants. If you're selling a service, you do it for a different type of, you know, customers. If you're building, uh, you know, something, you, you build the support to that something. So all ideas tend to become more complex with time. Generally speaking, the additional uh, elements of your idea tend to be marginally less profitable than your core because they bring you more growth, but the marginal profitability of that growth tends to be decreasing. So without knowing a specific you know, uh, part of the business we're talking um, about, I would say that the most important thing is to do a cost activity base of your business. You break it down in as many components as relevant and you try to run your PL for each of the individual components um, so that you allocate cost and you see which part is the profitable core. Um, once you've identified that, you kind of freeze for a while or cut or freeze for a while the non profitable part and you stick your uh, investments, your focus, your activities to your profitable core till you weather the storm. 
But in general, do you think it's time for more risk-taking or for people to be more cautious? Uh, you know, risk is a, uh, is, is a very uh, personal and a relative term. My, my sort of general answer would be, it depends if you can do without the financial or the economic parts that you put at risk. In other words, uh, this is not a time to risk something that can send you bankrupt. It is time to risk something that can give you a disproportionate amount of return if things turn in the, in, in the right position. So once again, uh, no macro answers in time of crisis. In time of crisis, it's super important that you go as granular as you can um, and that you make decisions that are individually right on their own account. So um, take the risk with anything that you can do without. If it is essential to the running of your business, don't risk it. Very good, very good, very good insight. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, as a business myself, like I told you, I work in co-working space and we also run some accelerator programs. We work with Google and Facebook. We're trying to bring entrepreneurs together and build um, new solutions. But in the midst of this crisis, we had to face a situation where should we you know, fire people um, and things like that. What, do you, what is your advice? Should people be protecting their employees more or try to think about survival of the business? So, you know, we always need to remember that behind uh, numbers and, and stats and uh, decisions, they're all as human beings, right? So the, the situation changes from case to case, and it depends, you know, if that human being is um, in need, in a difficult situation, or, you know, um, can, can weather the storm on, on his own right. Um, again, the, the general frame, I would say, is government, in general, uh, for the first time in my life, has actually proved to be willing, capable, and moving fast to protect the situation from the employees first and from the employer as well. And, uh, you know, we've seen government of right, left, and center joining on a social agenda that is centered on safety first and continuity of employment and protection. Um, so whatever you are, um, I would say that my, my first advice is understand well what government is providing because there is a very high chance that government is providing for a scheme of support or so some sort of, you know, um, social, uh, social uh, uh, safety net um, and move within those guidelines. Within those guidelines, safety first. Um, of the of, of the human beings that are involved in this decision, um, and you know, long term sustainability of the business uh, immediately after. I know that's something that's very key to you, and thank you for pointing it out. Um, this question was actually from Maria from Russia, so thank you, Maria, for asking this. Um, our next question is coming from Stefan from Serbia, and he wants to know. Um, as a business investor, um, what do you think that pandemic has taught us so far? Um, I could go very philosophical on this. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll touch on philosophy and go very quickly into, into the, the, the business. The philosophy basically is that the pandemic has taught us that there are way more important things than the one that we were valuing as, as the more important at any point in time. You know, we, we were valuing that sort of, you know, social connectivity, the unnecessary, let's say, fluff of, you know, celebrity life. And we were valuing um, individuality, you know, to, to a different degree than what it should be valued. And I think that being all locked, or most of us locked into environment of family and real relationship and missing our friends and our elderly and, and missing that, um, you know, relationship with humans that matter, um, refocused on what's important. So that, that's the philosophical part. Um, and I think that, you know, we will come out of this a stronger world, a stronger humanity, a stronger society. Will come out of this society that will be able to judge 
better what matters and what doesn't. Um, philosophy aside now, um, I think that uh, what has taught me on a, on a day-to-day basis is that um, if something appears to be too good to be true, it probably is. And if something appears too bad to be you know, real, probably is. And so um, when we were seeing um, valuations for companies that were you know, inflated, when we were seeing 12 years of you know, markets that were roaring, where we were seeing you know, uh, wealth um, multiplication, concentrations and excesses that were shown, um, you know, that were just out of uh, uh, any balance. We should have known that um, it was not possible, uh, not real, too good to be true. And we should have prepared and, and, and limit ourselves and our forecast to adapt. So, you know, in, in good times, it's very difficult to realize um, that it's not norm and it shouldn't be treated as norm. So this is a little bit of a slap in the face to everybody that thought that that normality was such a thing. And I think it will remind us, you know, for the future that when we see things that are too good to be true, they probably are. I want to know, are you optimistic or should people be optimistic right now about the future or facing this current situation? The answer is yes. I think that humanity has to be optimistic about um, anything. And the reason is very simple, which is that if you are optimistic, you look up versus the current situation and you open up a gap that you then put action to fill, to, to fill and to, and to uh, contribute at least, you know, to, um, to make up for that gap. If you're not optimistic, you satisfy yourself with the status quo, you can adapt to the lowest standards and you know, the progress in society. So I am an optimist, I stay an optimist, and I um, believe that optimism is the way to come out of this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Roman, there is a way that the Romans you know, used to say back in the empire you know, days, which was per aspera ad astra, which means through difficulties up to the stars. It is only when you feel pain that you can go through and you know, have you know, meaningful rewards. This is wisdom of 2000 years. Um, I believe that per aspera ad astra, it's a philosophy of life that keeps us always focused that when you are in darkness, there is light at the end of the journey. Um, and so I, I stay an optimist, but it's a sort of a, an aware optimist that the darkness of the days that we're living through in this moment is serious and it should not be underestimated in any, in any way. It is both um, at a human level and at an economic level, um, the most serious crisis that I think the world has been you know, part of probably since the beginning of the uh, 20th centuries uh, you know, during the wars. So. And I think, yes, we're in difficult time but we do have the responsibility of rising back. And it's also a time where people have to be smart and people have to be thinking about the future. So thank you for your words about that. I'm going to pivot the conversation a little bit more um, into entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs who are trying to create solutions, who are trying to solve for problems, because I know many of them around the world right now are trying to think about what's the next thing, where should they go, what should they create, where can they create impact, both in terms of social, economic, but also for the, um, for the planet. Um, you do interact with entrepreneurs, well, One Young World Trustee, we thank you for your commitment doing that, and we understand your love and passion for the future generation. Um, you do interact with entrepreneurs. What do you look for? For example, I'm, I'm from Haiti. I can sell you the Caribbean. I can sell you the sun. I can sell you a lot of beautiful things. But as an entrepreneur and investor yourself, what do you look for in, within entrepreneurs when they're pitching to you? Um, so, of course, you know, it, it, it's a very complex thing. Um, and, and my general approach decisions about uh, business and entrepreneurs is people, ideas, execution in that order, right? So the first it's, you know, about the people, then you say, what is the idea you have? And then, you know, how likely you are to execute well. So let's stay on people. That is the first, the first uh, part. Um, what I've noticed, and, you know, I've been lucky enough to really meet 
you know, hundreds of entrepreneurs in my life and, and um, have, you know, deep conversation with them and understand how the journey was successful, not successful. If I would plot and, and you know, uh, rank the important attributes, I would say intellectual curiosity first. Um, uh, people that have not shown intellectual curiosity in their lives, um, any aspects of their life, personal, business, professional, sports, whatever. Intellectual curiosity, uh, if you do not have it, you're very likely not going to succeed as an entrepreneur because entrepreneur requires adaptability, relentless, flexibility, you know, learning every day, every moment. So intellectual curiosity is first. Um, the second is evidence of ethical behavior. Um, if I see somebody that does not have respect for others, if, does, if I see somebody that has um, you know, an arrogance, um, with all, you know, disrespect for views for either people or planet. Um, if I say somebody that does not have an evidence of ethical behavior, um, I don't think you can be successful. Uh, I don't think you should be successful, but I don't think you can be successful either because, um, to run a company and to build a brand, you need to do it in context of other people that are part of your team and the society, community and planet of which you're part. So if you do not, if you're not predisposed to do that over time, you, you, you can't and, and you won't succeed. Um, so ethical behavior is number two. Um, I would say number three is an optimist outlook to things for the reason that I expressed before. You know, people with an optimist outlook to things look up and always work in, in ways to deliver uh, on that upward uh, dream, if you want. And the last one is a bias for action. Um, you know, entrepreneurs needs to be able to just roll up the sleeve and do anything or sit up and look at the horizon and do this vision to execution, always with a bias for action. So, um, yeah, I would say this intellectual curiosity, um, evidence of ethical behavior, uh, you know, the optimist outlook and bias for action. Oh, very inspiring. Thank you. We, we run accelerator programs in Haiti. We work with entrepreneurs. We're trying to, to create businesses leveraging tech and see how that can create more growth for the country. And these are literally what we really look at. It's, it's really about people um, before ideas, but that curiosity is so important. Wow, I would, I would stay the whole day chatting with you, but we're running out of time now. Um, well, uh, Elio, if you would have a final thought for the One Young World community and every entrepreneur who would be watching this video now, what would be your last thought before we wrap it up? Um, I think that um, creativity and um, innovation is what moves the world. Um, if uh, there is no creativity and innovation in what we do and how we do things, we would stand still and the world would stop progress. And that applies to anything, politics, business, anyway. So entrepreneurs are the very heart uh, of both creativity and innovation. They are into a journey to create something. So keep your dreams up, keep your optimism going, Remember that you are part of a larger system. Do it ethically and, and behave with intelligence, uh, but keep creating and keep innovating. Well, thank you very much, Elio. Let's all give a big thank you to Elio for his time. Um, we hope to see you again um, on another series of One Young World Together Apart. Um, and don't forget to like, comment, and share this session. Thank you very much for watching and take care. It was great talking to you, Mark. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone.